Welcome to episode 259 of Freshly Grounded. This episode is from our live house show with Abdul Hakim, aka Sunnah Remedies, who is a regular guest on Freshly Grounded, but had recently taken about a year and a half off social media. And so this reunion reunion was much anticipated. I am reading this, uh, as you may be able to tell, if you're looking at the screen. I wrote I wrote this readout so I don't get it wrong, and so I don't waste your time. But I didn't do great on punctuality, so... Breathing-wise, I haven't really added many commas and pauses for myself. Anyway, I'll carry on. If you're new to Freshly Grounded and don't know who Abdul Hakim is, he's a hijama practitioner, but anyone who knows him personally knows he's so much more than that. He's a khatib, a speaker on healthy eating and healthy living, and his mission is to educate people on prophetic healing and regularly drops gems. So it's going to be one to listen to. But before we get into the episode, however, uh, I do want to let you guys know about a very, very important cause that we would love you, the listeners, to help us with. Six million people are still dis- are still displaced across Syria, having fled attacks on their towns. Many are living in tents this winter with their families displaced in their own country. Through releasing this episode, we're looking to raise £2,000, which will transform the future of an entire family. £2,000 will provide a family with brick and steel homes consisting of two bedrooms, a living room, a bathroom and a kitchen that will last at least 10 years. In the past, whenever we reached out to this amazing community, you guys, the freshly grounded community, you've always pulled through like only the FG tribe does. So I'm certain that together we can hit this 2K target really, really easily. In fact, if I know people say this all the time, but if everybody that watched this episode just donated a pound, we'd hopefully very fast raise £2,000. Uh, to donate, hit the link in our description. And if we manage to raise more, we'll increase the target to provide more homes, inshallah. For now, enjoy episode 259 of Freshly Grounded. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum bro. Wa alaikum salam, akhi, you threw dust in my face. You were technically, you weren't in front of me, so hopefully yeah. I'll get away with it. Inshallah, inshallah. How's things, how are you doing? Well, alhamdulillah, it's good, it's good. Good to be back. Yeah, how do you feel to be back after such a long time? Um, akhi, a bit nervous, because obviously you're not used to uh, something for a long time. So uh, I'm hoping, inshallah, that you know a lot of people can take benefit. So the main thing, inshallah, is that people benefit and kind of implement whatever is said. And what is it, whatever is easy for them. Uh, to, to kind of apply that to their day-to-day uh, living, inshallah. So, getting into, I'm I'm, con- or I'm I'm keeping an eye on everything time-wise so that we we stick to it, unlike last time. Um, the first episode that you came on freshly grounded for, you 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 spoke extensively about health and the health and the diet of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then you spoke about what you see in society going wrong. Often we had. The, the, a few viral clips from that episode when you were talking about the curry, uh, when we talked about a few, a, few, <laughs> a few other bits. But um, what was really cool is that I think a lot of it was relatable to a lot of people. And so now, kind of four years after that episode, I want to ask you the same question, which is what, what do you see through, for example, your clients and through society and, and the people that you see around that, that you think in our general day to day diets, where we're going wrong? I think overall, uh, metabolically, um, we're ill. And, uh, you know, when I say metabolically, our blood sugar levels, our, uh, a lot of things in terms of our insulin resistance. Um, a lot of people that come to us in the clinic, they're ill because it's sometimes, or majority of the time, our life habits or our life choices that we make on a day-to-day uh, basis, uh, maybe unknowingly, um, and it's important a lot of people come to us in the clinic and they think that hijama or cupping or wet cupping will solve all their problems, like it's a silver bullet. Um, we've heard a lot of people say that, including Boris Johnson, but in terms of yani, hijama, by itself, it doesn't do much. So it's part, the way that we approach health is from a holistic point of view. And inshallah, I want to talk about that more explicitly uh, throughout the, the show. And it's never rely on something alone because whether it might be injury, sometimes some, a football player might come in or someone who's an athlete or a sport or a, uh, athletic person, he might come in with an injury and hijama alone might not solve the problem. He might need to strengthen the muscles. Maybe the pain is coming from, maybe there's a trigger point somewhere else. Um, so don't rely on one thing. You know, always when you're looking at health or anything in life, look at the whole picture. 
Don't look at something, you know, isol don't isolate something and think, you know what, this is the solution to my problems. It might be a, wi a wide variety of things that you need to kind of uh, face and inshallah in there solve to kind of complete the whole picture. So what, what kind of things, you, you spoke about the, the, the metabolic... Uh, uh, yeah, so, I mean, look, we eat too much. Fine. We eat too much, this is the problem. Because we have, food is readily available for us. And just because somebody might be, he, look, he might look healthy, he might look thin. Um, that's not always the, the, the yardstick that we use to, to, to measure optimal health. Because we have fat cells in our body and genetically speaking, they fill up differently according to your genetics, according to your background. Um, and the reason, okay, so I'll give you an example, Asian people. The reason why I say this is because I get a lot of Asian brothers that come to me. And some brothers as well. So, say for example, their fat cells you'll find, mashallah, generally they, Be they careful now. They won't put on. They won't put on. What about Asian they, 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 they won't fat put cells. on weight. They won't, as in, say for example, they won't. Their fat cells won't fill up as much as other people. So, say for example, you might find, find a brother who, who eats a lot of junk, and again, that could be because of obviously his uh, his metabolism. But internally, you know, we have to see how much fat does he have around his organs, visceral fat that's surrounding his organs that's inside compared to obviously his fat cells filling up due to unhealthy food. So there's, there's a lot of things to kind of consider rather than just simplistically saying, you know what, okay, I'm putting on weight or it's not as simple as we, we kind of perceive. And health, actually, health, ideally, when we look at health, we can't look at it from a, a linear point of view. You know, it's something that is combined with a lot of things like stress, um, depression, uh, anxiety, these are all interlinked with your physical health, believe it or not. And you know, there's a lot of studies, subhanAllah, which we'll, which we'll inshallah discuss later on. I, and I do want to talk about sugar as well, um, uh, surely, because we, we kind of discussed it in the back and about how kind of it's become, or it is an addiction for most of us. So, no. um, before we go into that, we, we, like I said, we spoke about the diet of the Prophet Sallallahu so Alaihi Wasallam, and so I want to so just go over that. So what do we know about what his diet was like? A lot of hunger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was not known to eat a lot. Um, some people will say because obviously the hardship that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam suffered uh, in the early years of uh, you know, propagating Islam to, to, to people and trying to spread the message. Um, and we have many narrations of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have the famous narration of Aisha Radiallahu Anha where she said there was three days, uh, sorry, three months in which you know, back in the days they would have, say for example, a hole in the ground where would, they would kind of heat food. So the Prophet Aisha radiallahu anha said that for that three months we just ate al uh, aswadain And in Arabic, Arabic is such a rich language that when you, so say for example, you have black and, and water. So the color black is overpowering over water. So in Arabic, in the, in the language, we use the, the, the word that is overpowering. So the Prophet Aisha radiallahu anha said, said al aswadain the two black things. Water isn't black. But the dates, they were black, so they are overpowering over water. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he only uh, ate uh, dates and drank water for three months. So yani, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in many ahadith as well, he would always, you know, we, we hear the famous ahadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ate a third, he would, he would eat a third of food, a third of water, and he would leave a third empty for, to breathe. And nowadays, I'm sure, I'm sure we're not even familiar, like we can't even breathe after we eat. You know, we have to walk holding our stomach. And, Amazingly, I mean, a lot of us think that this, this is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, if you look, the hadith doesn't begin this way. The hadith it begins with a, a few uh, morsels or a few portions of food is sufficient for the son of Adam in order that his spine is upright. So we don't need to eat too much. You know, a lot of, you know, we don't, our body doesn't require a lot of food. Our body does not require a lot of food to operate. And, you know, sometimes, subhanAllah, like, you know, we see the, the, you know, there's many, many scholars, they would say that the, the prophets, they would eat once a day. The righteous, they would eat twice a day. And this would help with their cognitive ability. It would help them, them to stay sharp. And I'm going to go back to the first point. Health is not looked at from a linear point of view. Now, I'm not saying everyone should fast, because there are some people who, if they fast, it's actually, you know, against, you know, it's not going to be helpful for them, especially if they suffer from specific illnesses. And I'm not kind of, you know, health is not something that is, is, is a size to fit everyone. It should be tailored to the individual according to his, his um, you know, his, uh, his medical history. So when someone comes into us for hijama, and I wish, inshallah, in the future, like hijama therapists, 
inshallah there are there's a, you know there's a there's a few of us inshallah that we're trying to push uh, a more complex kind of approach to dealing with your patients yes if you're coming for a normal kind of session yes a simple hijama should do the job but if say for example the person comes in uh, he might have uh, diabetes uh, he might have a heart a heart condition where they're going to put him on blood thinners now if the person is on blood thinners what do you do then because his blood is going to be runny and then you're going to make incisions so again it's very very complex so when you work with your patients or when we work with our clients and antidotal experience is, is important you, you you spoke about kind of the fact and that we don't have to eat a lot no and uh, exactly. uh, first of all how, how much have you eaten today <laughs> no because i know the answer that's why i'm asking no uh i had breakfast uh i think maybe 11 no 10 30 10. so i haven't eaten since then but that's something that i usually do i try my best to do um not every time again i'm not a purist so when we look at health again and what you eat i'm not a purist i don't say to you, i don't eat only healthy food or well, we'll, we'll talk about that what is healthy food um, but I remember subhanAllah look fasting is a, is a tool every hijama is a tool fasting is a tool your diet is a tool these are all tools that should be used into contributing to your optimal health and part of optimal health is what your digestion as well that, so there's three things that we that I normally kind of consider or well, hopefully a person to be healthy that if three things so his digestion needs to be effective so he needs to be able to digest and break down the food that he's eaten the second absorption so he needs to absorb so your if your gut is ill your body is unable to absorb the nutrients and put it into your bloodstream and the third thing is elimination so whatever your body doesn't need and whatever there are whatever toxins there are in that food your body needs to flush it out otherwise that will affect the absorption from the food that you eat and I remember, like I said, going back to school, when we used to fast Ramadan, I'm sure everyone's aware, like, let me know, it's subhanAllah, if you had this experience, that when they would, when, say for example, non-Muslims, they would ask you, are you fasting? And you would say, yeah. They're like, oh, isn't that not healthy? Are you, are you okay? Are you going to survive? So subhanAllah, there was, and even amongst health professions and health... And now religions, everyone's pushing it. Now everyone, and you know what it is? This is something that I really wanted to kind of push. Like our religion, when we say that our religion is a complete way of life, it is really a complete way of life. And the more subhanAllah I study, and the more I look into like health, uh, holistic nutrition, uh, holistic way of life, mental health, physical health, spiritual health, I always come to the conclusion that subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, that we should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala day and night for gifting us with this amazing gift of Islam. Because when you look back, Allah is deep. It is very, very deep. And, and subhanAllah, Islam has not left one thing unturned. That we, and subhanAllah, like you see, like we fast. What does fasting do? We fast in Ramadan for 30 days. And we all know there's like a, you know, I'm sure there's a video that you've seen that, that goes around the first 10 days, the second 10 days, the third, ten, you know, the, the, the last third of the month. And fasting is important. And if you look at our religion, if you follow just the sunnahs of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who knows what days the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would fast? Mondays and Thursdays. There's a guy, I, I don't know the name, he's a, he's a doctor in the UK. He was going through a lot of health complications. He put on weight, uh, along with the other, I think his, high, he, his blood pressure was a bit high. He was getting towards the age of like, I think after 60. And he decided that he was, adopt, he was gonna adopt fasting. So he decided to fast. Guess what days he decided to fast? Mondays and Thursdays. And uh, it's, it's on, he's done a few documentaries regarding fasting. Now, why is fasting healthy? Someone has to ask themselves, why is, why, what is so special about fasting? So when you, when you kind of prevent your body from eating, your body, especially for a specific amount of hours, your body goes into what we call autophagy. Now what is autophagy? Autophagy is a process in your body, a cellular function, a cellular, uh, function that happens in your body where in our bodies there are proteins that are damaged. So you have certain cells in your body, they're damaged. And sometimes these could be the causes for many illnesses. All that Allah knows, maybe cancer, uh, maybe uh, diabetes, maybe, auto, maybe many autoimmune diseases such as multiple sclerosis, uh, acne, asthma. I'm sure these are all diseases that we're familiar with and maybe know many people that suffer from. So our body, subhanAllah, Allah designed it in a way that when our body, when our body um, it's like a switch that flips in the body. So your body kind of, once it goes past a certain amount of hours, 
your body, the body, subhanAllah, it's amazing. It's like a machine that switches the switch and your body starts to scan all those dead cells, all those harmful proteins that latch onto your body, that latch onto other cells, that latch onto other receptors, and it recycles it. It uses it as fuel and, and kind of gets rid of it, subhanAllah. So, and there's many studies as well, they say if you fast um, three days in a month, that your immune system recovers. And what's the first line of your defense? What helps to cure all your diseases? What helps to, to fight infections, viruses, bacteria? It's your immune system. It's the first line of defense. If your immune system is weak, then your body is weak realistically. And even if you can lift one, 10, 110 kg, even if you've got biceps, triceps, six pack, it don't matter. It does not matter at all. What is inside your body? This is, I don't, when I look at somebody, and subhanAllah, through my experience, when I look at somebody visually, even if he looks healthy, that's not the case always. Yeah. If we talk about the fact that we don't need much, as much food perhaps as we think we need yeah. in a day, um, how much of it is then linked to our minds and like dopamine and all that kind of stuff? You, you hear often people talking about dopamine and, and, and especially when it relates to food. Uh, let me go back one second. Before I answer that question, Fine. just one question, inshallah. In terms, like, in terms of fasting, if you were to count, and subhanAllah, I wanted to touch on this point, but subhanAllah, I need to slow down a little bit. Sure. In terms of fasting, if you were to count all the days, so the sunnah we said is Mondays and Thursdays. So yeah, that's you're looking at, so there's four weeks, yeah? So that's already khalas, 10 days, yeah? And then you've got the ayyam al bid so the, the sunnah days, which are what? Uh, the, white, the three days. The three white days. That's already what, 13 days. So subhanAllah, already in one month, you could be potentially fasting for 13 days. Yeah. Do we have a month to do one? Hmm? We will. We'll forget. I heard. I heard. What's that? What's that? What's that? I think so. Don't worry about it. We're not mathematicians. No, 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 it's around no. that figure. Yeah. So you. So maybe like you're looking at 15 days. For Allah, and if there's any mathematicians here, but you're a bit less. A bit less. Yeah. So look, you're fasting. So you got so fasting days. two days a week for four weeks and you came up with Eight. 10. Sorry, my bad, sorry, sorry. And everyone went... <laughs> you call it out, call it out. Yeah. So you're fasting for a lot, you're even yeah. in eight days, you're fasting for a week. And it's Plus. 11 when you have the three white days. So you've got the three white days, yeah. so that's the 13th, 14th and the 15th of every Islamic calendar, Hijri calendar. So that's a lot, a lot of days. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, so actually fasting is a tool that the Prophet mm -hmm. would use consistently, even the Sahaba as well. They so, would fast regularly. So dopamine. Okay, so do dopamine, isn't, dopamine isn't bad. Dopamine is a hormone like it helps us feel how we feeling at the moment. Uh, a sense of, say for example, they call it the pleasure hormone. However, sometimes if our body associates eating junk food, and they say, they say uh, scientifically, you know, there's a lot of studies coming out that uh, when you eat junk food or sugars that are high in sugar, uh, foods that are high in sugar, it triggers the same area within the brain that, that obviously is triggered in, on, when you're having drugs uh, or harmful substances. So you, you, you start to create an association. So every time you eat junk food, your body creates that kind of dopamine levels. But there's two, so in terms of dopamine, you have two types of, 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 of levels. So you have the tonic level, so every, we all have dopamine flowing through our body, but it's at a stable level. But you have a psychic, uh, fi uh, I think it's a physic uh, peak. So when your when your body kind of peaks in dopamine, then obviously it drops quickly. Then that's not good. So now your body is always searching for that high. And where does it search for that high? It, search for, it searches for it in, in junk food, sugary food, uh, junk food generally speaking. So you're always looking for that high. But in the same time, it's not that it doesn't love you back. Junk food doesn't love you back. Neither do drugs. So you're harming your body in desperation to seek that, that dopamine high. So it does have a part to play, yeah. I, I do always In terms think, of addiction, in terms of addiction, yeah. I do always think that when I, when I go for like a, if I'm going past the KFC drive through and there's a halal one near me, so no, I, no, I, I have to dip in quickly. Crazy. But whenever I do, I always have to think to myself, subhanAllah, like I, I was even full for like an hour and a half. Like it doesn't, it, it's so much that you eat, but you're not even full. Whereas when you have a, like a home cooked fresh meal, you're full for like four or five hours. Mm. For me, do you know what I mean? The, 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 speaking about that dopamine thing, is, is, there's a thing you often hear about sugar being more addictive than cocaine. Is that true? Or what's the basis I of that? I wouldn't go to that extreme. Fine. I wouldn't go to that extreme, no. Fine. 
um, all right, so we've kind of spoken about the stomach because I was going to ask you kind of about the stomach being the um, the, uh, the, the 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 place where a lot of illnesses are born. I remember you spoke, spoke to me about this before, but I do want to I don't I do want to move on to the the mind as well. So just to round up on kind of the physical health and and, and the food uh, and that kind of side of things, um, it, it seems to make sense to speak a bit about exercise and movement. And nowadays, especially since COVID, I was speaking to the brothers today saying that I, I need to go to the gym regularly because my general life is so like inactive i don't have an active day-to-day -day life at all i'm sat at a desk most of the time my job is this to talk to people like this i'm so i'm not burning calories and being active especially as at my age i, I should be because this is the age where people are active so um how, how, how important a role is that physical exercise moving about and and, and being active having an active lifestyle we're designed to move um, a sed any sedentary lifestyle is going to be harmful for you. And when we say, when we think about exercise, we're thinking that we have to, you know, go through high intensity workouts, go to the gym, lift dumbbells, you know, like they say, um, maybe you do, a no, those things are good. Um, however, if you're unable to do those things and you're busy, walk. I love to walk. I think walking is the most therapeutic you know, thing that you could do because especially by yourself, you I mean, walking is amazing. You know, they, an exercise in itself, they say that, um, again, we, we spoke about autophagy. So there's other studies to suggest that exercise increases autophagy more than fasting. So, and, and a lot of us, when we think about exercise, like I said, we think about, you know, extraneous uh, exercises and over, you know, over exerting ourselves, but that's not always the case. You can walk. Walking is very good because when you're walking, when we exercise and we have like several, we're putting our body through a lot of stress, our cortisol levels go up. So cortisol level, I'm sure everyone who is a science student, a cortisol, cortisol is a stress hormone that your body produces when you're under stress. However, when it's chronic, this is the problem. So when your body is under a lot of pressure, whether you're lifting weights, you know, whether you're, uh, I don't know, maybe doing high intensity workouts, especially there's a lot of pressure on your joints, your cortisol levels go up. Um, and the stress hormone, uh, so if your cortisol levels go up, your testosterone goes down, yeah? And people that over indulge in exercise, you find, even though, again, they look big or they look healthy or strong or muscular, they look like they've aged because there's a lot of autophagy. Like, again, our dean teaches us balance. And that's one thing, if you were gonna take something away from, from, from you know, myself today, take away balance. You know, both extremes are unhealthy, yeah? So if you exercise too much, I'm sure you're aware, it's a bad thing and it ages you. So you see a lot, I see a lot of uh, athletes, they put their body through a lot of work. And you see, yes, they look physically healthy, but they, they, they've aged. So again, walk. So yeah, and, and again, walk, walking, even, walking is quite relaxing. It doesn't raise your cortisol levels and you're burning fat. I like to walk, I walk, say for example, on average, my wife will know, uh, seven miles, five miles a day. A day. Wow. So I'll walk, say for example, in my clinic from, from Kilburn, I walk all the way to, to Fulham, Chelsea area. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's good, you know what it is, I talk to myself, it's good, it's good for you, it's therapeutic, it's good for the mind. Sometimes I... Um, I've, got my, I've got my steps as well, I count my steps, I think. Sometimes when I leave my house, my parking spot is taken, and so I park on the next road. <laughs> Why not? I'm burning, stressed. Yeah? <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I like, I'm thinking, should I work from home today? <laughs> I will press raining. No, so, I have to argue with my wife. Actually. She's like, no, I'll teach you. I was like, no, I want to walk. Wow. Um, okay, let, let, let's move on to the mental. I, and, and we can go back to, to food and diet um, when we do the QA later. So, any questions that you guys do have on that, inshallah, you can ask. Um, but the mental is really important. And, uh, and something that's so prevalent now. There's a clip of Freshly Grounded, probably the most viral clip of you on Freshly Grounded, which is when you were speaking about uh, role models and you were saying that young people shouldn't be taking uh, like the Kim Kardashians and so on and so forth as role models and you were explaining that uh, the role model that we should be taking and, and that got spread everywhere, right? And I think it's because a lot of people related to it and, and, and they found out even a lot about uh, people that we should be looking to as role models like Khadija radiallahu anha and Aisha radiallahu anha and so on and so forth. Um, now, again, through the experiences of clients and people you speak to, what do you see right now as kind of a real concern in people's mental health? Akhi, it's a lot, subhanAllah. 
sometimes it becomes a bit overburdensome, uh, especially when you, you know, subhanAllah, they come for hijama, but you know, me and my wife, we always joke, in a sense that it's, it, it's when you become like their therapist, like you said in the beginning. Um, it's quite, you know, subhanAllah, when you deal with people, you're not just a hijama therapist, or you're not, you're not just, uh, you know, uh, helping with their rehabilitation, Akhi, you're also getting to know the person on a personal level. Um, so you hear, Akhi, a lot of, a lot of sad, um, we all go through certain things in life, you know, nobody, I mean, everybody, everybody, subhanAllah, has tests and trials and, and tribulations in this dunya. Some are visible on somebody and some, subhanAllah, only when you get to talk to them, when they tell you something, you're like, subhanAllah, I didn't know that that person was going through that. Um, it could be, Akhi, from suicide, um, or like sometimes I get calls um, of, subhanAllah, brothers uh, contemplating on committing suicide. Um, as they have no, pur they, they feel like they have no purpose. Um, stress, uh, depression, worries of the dunya. Uh, but it does get, like I said, it does get a bit too much sometimes because you have to carry it sometimes. Um, family problems, every, whatever you whatever you can think of, we kind of encounter it. Um, but it's important. Look, like I wouldn't. Like one time I was sitting in a khutbah in Juma and there was an imam. He stood up and he said on the minbar, he said, um, he said, subhanAllah, why do we have uh, a growing number of people suffering from depression? That must mean that your iman is weak. And when I heard this, subhanAllah, I was upset. I was very, very upset. Uh, we know the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was sad for a year. Uh, now, I wouldn't want to say, subhanAllah, the Prophet Sallallahu was depressed out of respect to the Prophet Sallallahu but we know that there was a year after his wife, Khadija radiallahu anha, she died, and it was his uncle, who, subhanAllah, he wasn't Muslim, uh, Abu Muttalib, uh, I believe, he died, subhanAllah, and he wasn't a Muslim, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he lost his aid, his support, his wife, Khadija radiallahu anha, and he went through severe sadness. And this is the Prophet, someone who is receiving revelation, from Allah, from the creator of the heavens and the earth. And to the extent it was called Amal Huzn, the year of sorrow. Sorrow. So was the Prophet Sallallahu was, was he not high in his Iman? You can be very, very righteous. You can be close to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, but you can also be stressed. You can also be depressed. Yes, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, Allah that indeed with the remembrance of Allah, the hearts find the rest. Rest. I had a few of my clients, a lot of their family members actually committed suicide. One brother, subhanAllah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive him and have mercy, he jumped from the river Thames. Uh, another brother, subhanAllah, he hanged himself. So it is a taboo that is not spoken about often in the Muslim community. And like I said, everyone, every single one of us, we have worries, we have stresses. So, and it's important that we open up, we talk to somebody. You know, um, if you can afford, you know, find a therapist, a Muslim therapist. The reason why I say a Muslim therapist because he can relate to you and he can relate everything back to Islam because at the end of the day, if we say that we are Muslim, that means we submit to Allah. We submit to the rules of the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We submit to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's way of life. Do you think that a lot of our kind of like sadness can come from, like you're saying, not practicing Islam wholly, like in a full way, right? So for example, we might, like pray and fast like you're saying but miss out on things like i remember uh i, I can't remember if it, uh, it may it was it was around the episode with tim humble and he we were speaking about like council culture and a few other things on social media and he said that there's this principle in islam that the muslim he doesn't like jump to speak on every situation straight away right you see it and he says you you scope the situation right and you try and get an understanding you let the you let the the storm go and then you, you analyze. And now we're in a world where everything has to be commented on about now, we have to be, we have to have an opinion, we have to be, we have to be uh, uh, like, we have to have the answers to everything. If I ask you a question, you can't say, I don't know, because you, 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 you want to feel like you can, for example, yeah, deliver a TED talk on it. Yeah. So if, but if, we're, if, we're, if we're like that, then we're not necessarily practicing Islam wholly because we're not, we're not living the, these principles that aren't necessarily written about but they're known amongst people of knowledge like i have not read that you shouldn't jump on and talk about every topic but it was when i spoke to a person of knowledge who said that's the how the, the behavior of the muslim that how, that's how he is or like i remember when um 
l- again, small things like I remember uh, one thing I found really beautiful was when Sheikh Abu Osama he said that he said that the way a Muslim should be is that when he goes to somebody's house, he um, he sits on the chair that's facing away from the door, right? And the reason for that is because if anything happens, that like things go on, and for example, there's maybe the wife of the brother you're visiting, like, like comes in or whatever, and she, she didn't know, and then like you're like kind of protecting their honor, right? Yeah, yeah. And I was thinking, wow, like that's not written about, but these, this is the things that they know about, and that's living Islam holy, that's, that's knowing where to sit, that's how to sit, who to, like, uh, like, like all of these little things. And when we start living Islam holy, it, it, it must start fixing our, our our lives right and i want you to i, I want you to respond right but i want to just like give it fully over to you so i just want to give one last comment and it's about this it's about the same thing because I, I i just want you to go on this monologue about uh, us understanding the soul right which is obviously to do with islam so there's a there's a way i want to connect it which is that i i, I remember a brother noor you, you you know noor he sent this a whatsapp broadcast and he said he, i can't remember what sheikh was but one of the scholars he said that um i found that when I ate, I, when I um, fulfilled my desires with food, I would find it easier to commit sin and I would commit more sin. Because by fulfilling one desire, I found it easier to fulfill another desire. Okay. And, um, and I was like, wow, because, because eating isn't haram, right? But, but he's saying that by not being disciplined on that, he's lost discipline on other things. And, and that's why I wanted to kind of, t- before we finish, tie in the, the mind, the body and the soul. Because this, this is called healing the mind, the body and the soul. And, and the idea is, is what is the state of a person who has fixed up his physical health and fixed up his, fixed up his mental health, but like is missing that from the soul aspect. And so that's where I kind of wanted to hand it over to you and get an understanding of that wholesome, balanced Islam being a solution perhaps to like not having sadness maybe? Okay. Okay, so when your body is malnourished, what happens? What happens when your body is malnourished? You start to you start to become ill. Right. So what do you do? You feed yourself with food, nutritious food from the earth because what you made from? You made from earth. Your soul, where is it made? It's made in the heavens. If you don't, if your soul is malnourished, what's gonna happen, Akhi? You're gonna feel lost, you're gonna feel, again, you're gonna, you're gonna feel a, an emptiness, a void that can only be fulfilled by revelation which comes from the heavens. Do you understand? So a lot of us, our souls are empty because we don't have a relationship with the Quran. We don't have a relationship with the Quran. And now, a lot of us have an issue, say for example, maybe when we came to this event that you knew uh, how to get here, or maybe you put it on your sat-nav, but how anxious and how worried would you feel if you were just given a name and you were told to get there by yourself? No guidance, no... You'd feel quite anxious, you'd feel worried. But why is it that we neglect the Qur'an, we neglect the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and when we die, which we are born to die, yeah, and you make no any mistake of that, we are going to die, we are all going to die. Even the person who denies the existence of God, he believes that he will die one day. But why is it that we don't have an, yeah, a severe, severe anxiety or worry that we're just going around, work, waking up, doing our nine to five, conducting our life, usually, yeah, heedlessly, Ghafla, heedless, and that's one of subhanAllah, that's a disease of the heart. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, Ibn al-Qayyim al-Jawziya rahimahullah, he talks about it often. Being heedless, just living your life like a robot, waking up, going to work, but there's no connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's no connection, you know, with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you just, you're basically like a, a robot. Why is it that we don't, one day goes by, there's no, you don't read the Qur'an, two days, three days, four days, a month, a year. When's the last time you touched the Quran? The Quran is, is a map. When you read the Quran, it's Allah talking to you. Many of us, subhanAllah, we, we go through so much uh, stress, seeking the dunya. We invest 
money, money, truckloads of money because you want to be an entrepreneur, mashallah. You want don't give that's that's good. That's all good. But how much money have you invested into your hereafter, where you could be in the grave? Like, do you have any high? Now that's another thing. Do we have high aspirations? In is in Islam in Arabic is called ulu uh, al like high aspirations. Like we know the famous Sahabi, uh, I think it was Sa'd Sa'd bin Mu'ad or one of the, I can't remember his name, but when he passed away, the throne of Allah shook. And he was Muslim. He became Muslim at the age of thirty, and he died at the age of thirty-six. We're Muslim for sixty, seventy years, and your local fam, even your family, or your local community don't shake. This Sahabi, he was a Muslim for six years. And the throne, you have to understand, the throne of Allah, it shook because of happiness that it wanted to meet the soul of this Sahabi. And this Sahabi, he was one of the reasons that a lot of the tribes in Medina, al Aus al Khazra, I think, became Muslim. So we have to ask, do we have high aspirations for ourselves? Or how we live in our life? Yeah, and you just live in it casually. There's, you know, you, you will die one day. So at least when you die, maybe inshallah, leave something behind that people can say, you know what, the brother, mashallah, he left something good for the community. May Allah have mercy on him. Not you, you, you died and you left behind what a couple of, you know, Allah and them TikTok videos or Snapchat or a nice little picture, your six pack or whatever it is, or, you know, your dress in a picture. Well, Allah is sad. It is sad, but it's, it's funny at the same time. All the Sahaba, they had higher aspirations. All of them, from Umar radiallahu anhu. They had high aspirations. Even if you don't reach those things, at least you had the intention. And what, what's amazing about our religion is that your reward, based on your intention, the first ahadith that you learn, and especially when you first start, start coming to, you know, trying to practice Islam, is the hadith of Umar. That indeed actions are judged on intentions. So even if you don't reach that goal, you're still rewarded. What an amazing religion. You're sincere. So have, have that high aspirations that you want to achieve something in, in, in life, whether it's for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, giving back to your community, um, and there's many, and, and subhanAllah, you know it is as well, we sometimes we're too busy, like stuck in the worldly life, we forget that one day we're going to die. And another thing that causes the heart to be diseased is طول amal, Expecting that you're going to live forever. You know what, I'm going to buy a house on Beverly Hills, or I'm going to buy a house in Victoria, or Bayswater, and I'm going to make my first, well like sometimes I knew brothers that would say to themselves, yeah, you know what, when I'm 20, I'm going to make my first million. Like I said, don't get me wrong, it's not a bad thing, to make money, but don't let that be your priority. Don't let that be your only, your only worry. Because when we look at the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we hear famous ahadith, be in this world as if you are a traveler, a wayfarer, or a stranger. When you're traveling, do you take your, your, your washing machine? No, you don't. When you're traveling, do you take your, your widescreen TV? You don't, unless you're, you're not 100%. Yeah? So, then you know, we need to take you to therapy, inshallah. Yeah? But generally speaking, when you're traveling, you take a few little bit of, you're, you're traveling. And the Prophet Sallallahu said in another hadith, the likeness of me in this world is as if he's on a riding beast, he's on a horse, and he comes off the horse, and he waits underneath the, shel the, the, the tree, the, sh the shelter of a tree, takes rest, and keeps it moving like they say. You have to keep it moving in this. Don't become, look, and someone, you know, subhanAllah, like a lot of the West right now, and this frustrates me so much. And because maybe we don't know our deen, so where to blame? They package, so they might take fasting. And that's, to be honest, that's not something that's exclusive to Islam. That's ex that, that was in Christianity, Judaism, the Prophet Musa alayhi salam used to fast, Yahya, John the Baptist, they used to fast. So it was something, but they take something, so for example, uh, something that was, say for example, in Islam might be productivity. Now you hear a lot of these kind of motivational speeches and they say you have to wake up at four o'clock in the morning. Alhamdulillah, we wake up that early if you're praying Fajr anyway. Oh, it helps my productivity. We know the hadith of the Prophet they say that the barakah, the Prophet said that 
the barakah is in the morning for my ummah. So if you want to become someone who is successful, sleep early and try your best, especially if, obviously if Fajr is in the summer, you got Fajr is at 2, 3 o'clock, then obviously you are going to go back to sleep. But generally, if it's kind of later now, you have the winter period, try your best to be active in the morning because there's a lot of blessings in that time. Um, yeah, have high, well, like in terms of like, again, in terms of the, the, going back to the dunya, always, and I'm not trying to be morbid here, yeah, it's not, it's reality. You know, like I said, we are going to die. So the Prophet there was one time a group of Sahaba, they were burying someone. So they were burying someone, and when they were burying someone, the Prophet ﷺ, imagine the Prophet ﷺ trying to make his way through the crowd. And when the Prophet ﷺ, he saw the hole in the ground, he dropped on his knees. And he started crying and he said, That for this, i.e. the grave, let the people who are going to do actions, let them do actions. Yeah? And why? Because you're always, like, you're always in check. Because sometimes we, we can easily get sucked into this life and it's so easy. Look, I, and I can say that from experience. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a married man, I have children. Um, you work, you know, you're dealing cl with clients, you're dealing with patients, you're traveling, you're abroad. And it's so easy to lose focus. So this is why we always, again, remember these things. Not to be morbid, but to know where you're going. Because a lot of us, we don't know where we're going. We just go, we're just walking. Yeah? Okay, so... We've got Abdul Hakim 20, just under 25 minutes. And I wanted to open the floor to the audience, see if anybody had any questions uh, that they wanted to ask Abdul Hakim relating to whether it's the mind, the body, or the soul. Uh, the that we spoke about, isn't it? Um, so, ha any hands? Do we have any questions for Abdul Hakim? We've got, if you guys do have any questions, we've got a question um, at the top. We just, if you just wait for. Um, one of the volunteers, I think Yusuf's gonna come with some kind of recording device. So you just got a hand. If you just keep your hand up, inshallah. Ah, uh, cool. Um, should I speak up, yeah? Can you yes, hear please. me? Uh, so it's like two questions in one, yeah? Obviously, you're speaking about fasting. What motivates you to fast? Because sometimes you need that motivation. And also, what kind of motivates you, generally speaking, to kind of like, to strive, to push you to do goodness? And obviously, you're talking about you know, nurturing the soul and stuff. What what's some tips that you can like give in terms of like to motivate you? Zakallah um, <clears throat> for the question. In terms of fasting, okay. So twenty five minutes, yeah. Okay. Halas. <laughs> so in terms That's of. That's a very quick one. Uh, in terms of, um, I'll give you an example. So, say for example, you're engaged in something that might be haram, smoking or listening to music. Yeah? I would never tell somebody, Akhi, you need to stop smoking now. Or you need to stop listening to music now. Now, our religion is built, one of the principles that Islam is built upon is commanding the good and forbidding the evil. Now this has certain rules and regulations that have to be followed. Not like say for example, you're in East London and you're seeing non-Muslims doing haram and you're pulling up and you say, hey, put that alcohol, no, it doesn't work like that. And to be honest, subhanAllah, this is something that, this is not from the wisdom of forbidding the evil and commanding the good. So say for example, when say for, I'll give you an example. Yeah? A patient of, comes into the clinic and he has a problem with smoking. It could be smoking weed. It could be uh, smoking cigarettes. May Allah subhanahu wa protect us. But so what I normally do is I try my best to encourage him to cut down. Yeah, so any habits that we have in life, some people can go cold turkey. Some people can't. So always, say for example, decrease. And likewise, and replace it with something good. So part of commanding the good and forbidding the evil is that you don't tell that person, you don't tell that person to stop doing something and you don't, and you don't provide an outlet for him. Like say, and I'll give you an example, in, in music. So say for example, music um, is haram. Yeah, and I've got the opinion that it's haram. Whatever you say, and in terms of the, listening to music, it's haram. So you could 
say to the brother, look, there's some anashid, there's some nasheed that you could listen to and they're quite good. Yeah, there's a lot of nasheed artists, especially now <laughs> up and coming and they've got a nice flow about, you know, so you're providing him with an outlet. So uh, your priorities have to be in check. And uh, subhanAllah, why I'm smiling, they reminded me when I used to work in Saudi, I don't know if I should say this. When I used to work in Saudi, I used to work with a group of brothers, yeah? And one of the brothers, subhanAllah, like, this, and this is to, to, to kind of highlight the importance of priorities. Because a lot of us, our priorities are not in check. So that's why we, we wreck ourselves. Yeah, if you don't check yourself, you wreck yourself. So what they would do, so this brother, what I normally do when I'm working, I had my own apartment and they used to kind of chill at my apartment. I would put, when I'd leave to work, I'd put the Quran. So I put Surat Al-Baqarah as a form of Ruqya. And it was Al-Affasi, I'm sure, have you, who's heard of Al-Affasi? Yeah, a lot of you have heard of Al-Affasi. So he does nice nasheeds, sometimes he does nasheeds. And I was with a brother, and this brother, mashallah, is knowledgeable. And he, he held the opinion that nasheed is haram. Yeah, he was quite stringent. And uh, I, don't know, I don't hold that opinion. I believe it's permissible as long as there's no uh, musical instruments. It's permissible. So in the morning, I left the Quran. The Quran was playing, Surah Al-Baqarah was playing. I finished work in Saudi. Obviously, we finished teaching in a university and we drive back to our apartments. And there'd be music, so uh, Nasheed. So Nasheed was playing after. So when the Nasheed was playing, he walked in. He's like, yo, bro, he's American. I don't know if I can do the accent yet. But he's like, this is Haram. I said, no, it's not haram. Yeah, it's not haram. I don't, I'm of the opinion. And this is another thing that we have to start respecting. In Islam, yeah, in jurisprudence, fiqh, there is differences of opinion that have to be respected. Now, these differences of opinion, not any Tom, Dick and Harry can come and say, ah, oh, there's difference of opinion. No, these differences of opinion are built by scholars, yani heavyweights in the religion of Islam that have drawn these rulings from the Quran and the Sunnah. So anyway, fast forward. So then he said, I was sitting, I said to him, okay, I'm not of, anyway, I'm not of the opinion that it's haram. Then he said to me, he said another comment which showed that his priorities were not in the right place. So coming back to your point in terms of fasting, start off slowly. So say for example, you wake up, you normally have breakfast. I don't know, so what time do you normally have breakfast, uh, Sheikh? What time? That's even, that's, that's amazing, yeah? So you have brunch, you have, is it a big lunch? Is it big? Khalas, alhamdulillah, so now you've already, and when's the last time you stopped eating? When's your last meal? Probably after Maghrib, like four or five. You're intermittent fasting, bro. Yeah, wait, let's go to another question, inshallah. Just raise your hand if you have a question, we've got a question over there. Uh, okay, so um, I know you mentioned that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi he went through periods of extended sadness or even other extreme emotions at times, like on the night of revelation. Um, is there anything from the life uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu or even the Sahaba um, that we can learn about kind of what to say or how to help someone who's going through these extreme emotions? Oh, that's, an amazing that's, an, that's an amazing question. Emotional intelligence. Something that a lot of brothers and sisters lack. Yeah, emotional intelligence. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the most intelligent when it came to emotions. A lot of brothers, actually, when, you're, when you find, I'll give you an example, yeah? There was a brother, subhanAllah, who both me and uh, brother Faisal know. He's, he's suffering from cancer at the moment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give him shifa. And um, it's been quite tough for the brother. Uh, SubhanAllah, he sh anyone that goes through any type of illness has highs and lows. You know, you always go through that having hope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then naturally having fear, which is like, you know, SubhanAllah, that we're supposed to have anyway. Hope, you know, a bird cannot fly with one wing. And this is why we are encouraged in Islam to have both hope and fear. And uh, Fudayl, Fudayl ibn Iyad, a famous scholar, he said that when a person is alive, he should have more fear of Allah than hope to keep him in check. When a person is on his deathbed or when he is ill, he should have more hope than fear. But in terms of the question, like, I'll give you an example. Like, you, when you see someone struggling, like you don't say to them, like with this brother, there's another brother that came to him in the masjid and he looked at him and he said, and the brother, subhanAllah, he lost a, little, he lost a bit of weight and he said to him, bro, like you look terrible. Like this is like zero level of intelligence, emotional intelligence, zero. So when a person, subhanAllah, is going through trials and tribulations, you comfort them. You, ha you know, you have words of comfort. May Allah make it easy for you, Akhi. 
May Allah make it as a, as, as a means to cleanse you. You know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow it to, to, to increase your, your levels in the hereafter. A lot of us, we have this assumption that because we are going through trials and tribulations, Allah dislikes us or Allah is punishing us. Sometimes, many of the scholars said that Allah puts us through trials and tribulations because Allah wants to give us a level in Jannah that is unobtainable through our actions. And that can be a mercy. So always be soft, always be, and we know the Prophet ﷺ, yes, he went through trials and tribulations, but he never, he never, he was not someone who was serious all the time. The Prophet ﷺ, the Sahaba, they said about the Prophet ﷺ, we never knew anyone that smiled as much as the Prophet ﷺ. SubhanAllah, he was always smiling, but yet SubhanAllah, imagine he was going through trauma, trials, the Sahaba were getting killed, they were being thrown out of Mecca, uh, they were going through so much hardship. So as a Muslim, we're always, optimistic we always give words of comfort speak to the brother if you know that the brother is going through some severe mental health issues or he's going through some you know problems in his life be there for him sometimes akhi, all you need or all we need is to speak to people that's what you only that's all it is akhi, all you, just, just be that ear for him that you listen to him sometimes you won't even need to don't say much just be that kind of shoulder that he has and that you listen to him. And a lot of brothers, subhanAllah, I mean sisters, mashaAllah, they, they're quite good with their emotions in the sense that they like to talk, mashaAllah, not in a bad way, yani, but they, they like to communicate. But with, bro with brothers, they like to really just, they like, they like to hold it in. So this is not something that is, that is encouraging. Yani, talk to brothers, you know, have close friends that you can open up to, that you can offload. Exactly, we've got another question. We've got um, <clears throat> 12 minutes. So going back to the fasting, I want to ask a question, basically, how would you balance fasting and say, for example, someone had the goal of going to the gym, they're trying to increase their muscle mass. Typically what's propagated in the industry is that you have to increase your calorie intake, right? So how would you balance fasting? Like say if you want to implement the sun in your life, you know, regularly fast every week and whatnot, how would you implement that? And um, Contrary to the belief that people have in the industry that if you fast, you lose muscle mass. Is that the, yeah? If you fast, you lose muscle. Yeah, yeah that's, that's incorrect. If you look at the studies, it's actually the opposite. You don't lose muscle when you fast. And if you want to put on mass, mashallah, we've got a few brothers in the audience, mashallah, who come to me regularly, they're big, um, you can now, in, terms of, in terms of increasing your size, you'd have to increase your, your calories, isn't it? So you'd have to increase in your calories. That's my advice, Akhi. Increase in your, say, for example, you want to put on weight, increase the calories, and you can still eat and eat and fast. So just after, after Maghrib? After Maghrib, Akhi, yeah, increase your calories, inshallah. You but slowly, again, say, for example, progressively. Progressively, yeah? So what about like Monday and Thursday fasting type of thing? Yeah, but you, you're still breaking the fast. You're not fasting 24 hours, Akhi. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, you fast, say, for example, you, can't, you can fast for 16 hours, 13 hours, and when you break the fast, you eat, say, for example, uh, you increase your calories into, say, for example, that like you're maybe by two, three hundred calories and you keep it consistent. Do you understand? Yeah, eventually, you, and especially when you go into the muscle, you're, you're, when you go to the gym, sorry, you're ripping up muscle. And then obviously for your muscle to repair, you know, obviously you need protein. You'd, obviously you'd work with somebody closely with that. Yeah? Do we have another question? I just had a question about um, mental discipline. So what kind of advice can you give to make sure that you stay mentally disciplined? Because a lot of the stuff you mentioned with fasting and all of that requires, you know, a strong amount of mental discipline. And usually, like most of the times, it, it's within short periods of time. So what advice can you give to have it for long, sustained amounts of time? The same advice that I give, the same advice in terms that I gave the brother. Um, the Prophet ﷺ, look, he said, the reason why I love to use the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ because I see how we can apply it in our everyday life because and there's a lot of wisdoms and gems from them the prophet what did he say ahabbul a'mali ila allah and i think the brother mentioned it adwamuha wa inqal that the most beloved actions to allah are the ones that are done small but consistent yeah i think there's a book uh, in terms of it's called the atom effect where the author talks about um, introducing uh, good habits but over a long period of time you know, they become bigger. And, and that's my advice, Akhi. Don't, a lot of us, we want to go into something and, and overzealous. Like, that could be the same for Islam. A lot of us, when we start practicing, we want to go proper, we want to go in. 
We want to go. Like, we want to even almost like start an annexing people and and you know. Uh, shouting at people and telling them, you're going to Jahannam, uh, you know, like you have the keys to Jannah. Yeah, but you're gonna you're gonna burn yourself, you're gonna you're gonna over you're gonna, you're gonna you're gonna burn out. Anything that you do, try your best to start off small but consistent and increase over a period of time. Yeah? Don't overburden yourself because sometimes actually, you can go in and many of us do it because we're so like we have motivation. There's a difference between motivation. Motivation actually, is a sh is, is short lived. Yeah, it's consistency that will take you to your to, to your uh, to your final destination. So be consistent, and inshallah you'll get there. Allah. But take it. You go according. You're not compete. You know, Subhanallah. A lot of us when we do things, we compete against other people. Whether it's work, uh, you're looking, and that's why uh, me personally, I'm not. I don't have social media at the moment. I'm not. I don't run my social media because I believe that Subhanallah there is a disease that a lot of people are dis predisposed to on social media. And you said, you mentioned the video, that comparison is the thief of joy. We want to be everybody else except for ourselves. We want to do everything else that everyone else is doing. Don't, you're not in competition with anybody. You're in competition with yourself. Every day that you're, that you're better, you're winning. And subhanAllah, because we live in a society where there's so much pressures, uh, pressures to be wealthy, whatever that means, Pressures to be, uh, subhanAllah, whatever it is, to have a particular type of body. Who said akhi, that that particular type of body is healthy? Do we all come in the same shape and sizes? No, there's different types of bodies. There's mesomorph, there's endomorph, there's ectomorph. People genetically, they're, they're different. Some people have wide, wider shoulders than others. Some people have bigger legs than others. They're genetically, the genetics do play a part in that. Nobody is created the same. So you go according to, 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 to your ability, don't overburden yourself. How do you combat, combat overthinking? Because I think that's something I've struggled with a lot, which is coming to terms with the fact that actually when you blow something way out of proportion in your own mind, that doesn't actually exist. And so you think oh, this person will think this or others will think that. And really, people are so busy with their own lives that they're not really concerned with you as much as you're concerned with you. And I think that helped me, understanding that people don't care in a really, like, it sounds, it sounds weird, but it's, it's quite reassuring because you'd always, you're probably overthinking it. How do you battle overthinking? You don't come across someone who overthinks at all. Sometimes I do. Some, we're human beings, sometimes I do. But I put it always in perspective of, like you said, um, people are busy. Um, Always having husn al dhan, like always thinking good of your brother and sister. Um, never take things personal. Unless it's clear, then Imam al Shafi'i, rahimahullah, and I love this poem. Imam al Shafi'i, rahimahullah, he said, Zin man wazanka bima wazank, wa ma wazanka bihi fa zinhu, man jaa ilayka fa ruh ilayh, wa man jafaka fa sudda anh, man dhanna anna kadhunahu. فترك هواه إذا وهنه ورجع إلى ورجع إلى رب العباد فكل ما يأتيك منه. That's how Imam Shafi رحمه الله he says a profound saying. He says because sometimes we're social beings we we interact socially isn't it? So sometimes you oh, did the brother you know did the sister violate me did she did she يعني have a dig at me or did the brother did the brother offend me or did he disrespect me? Yeah. But sometimes أخي, people, they genuinely, and our religion is a, a religion of forgiveness. We overlook things. The Prophet ﷺ always encouraged overlooking things. If you don't overlook, overlook things, أخي, you have no friends. But sometimes our, our religion is a, is a natural religion. A lot of people, they love to portray our religion, especially people that are in da'wah, that is unnatural. Our religion is natural. Sometimes people are going to be nasty, and sometimes people are going to offend you. أخي, you, lock it, you lock it off. And like they say, you keep it moving. And Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah, he said this. He said, Zin man wazank bima wazank. He says, when, say for example, someone has offended you and hurt your feelings, you don't have to be friends with the guy. Weigh, Zin man wazank bima wazank. Weigh that person according to how he weighs you. Wa ma wazank bihi fa zinhu. Man jaa ilayka fa ruh ilayh. When whoever someone visits you, visit them back. Show them, when someone, like we say in common day terms, when someone shows you love, show them love back. It's reciprocated. Yeah? And whoever ignores you or don't, doesn't acknowledge you, then do the same thing. Don't acknowledge him. You're not at sin. Keep it moving. 
من جاء إليك فروح إليه ومن جفاك فصد عن من ظن أنك دونه that whoever thinks that they that you are below them فترك هواه إذا وهنه then let his ego uh, فترك هواه إذا وهنه let his ego kind of humiliate him we got too much ego especially mashallah social media أخي everyone mashallah superman فترك هواه إذا وهنه ورجع إلى رب العباد فكل ما يأتيك منه and go back to Allah for everything that you have is from him. Nothing comes from anybody else. Don't put your hopes in people because everybody will let you down. Yeah, don't, put, don't have high hopes in people because people are human beings. How many times have you let people down? Put your, and, and the Prophet Sallallahu he said, whoever puts his trust in anything other than Allah, Allah will leave him to, what, to that which he put his trust into and he's gonna fail you. But whoever puts his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and has good thoughts of Allah, Allah will never let you down. Yeah? So Islam is a natural religion, akhi. If you have, like I said, if you're overthinking, akhi, and you always talk to yourself. Jazakallah khair. Uh, Abdul Hakim, that's going to be time, or T minus two minutes. So if you want to do a little two minute uh, uh, um, kind of outro, you're more than welcome to, but I'll, uh, I'll outro you I'm and myself by saying Jazakallah khair. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's been an absolute honour of having you back on. Um, we haven't had you on for such a long time and I always love speaking to you and I'm really glad that this time we've been able to share that with our audience and I, I hope you guys have enjoyed it, uh, having Abdul Hakim as our guest and, and enjoyed the house show in general. Thank you so much for being so generous and, and supporting the cause in Syria too. And uh, we, we plan to do these live episodes more often inshallah. If you guys have suggestions of who you'd like to see, then do let us know uh, on these live shows. But otherwise, honestly, it was an absolute pleasure and uh, I hope we can get you back in the studio again soon as well. Jazakallah khair. Uh, barakallah fiq and jazakallah khairan for your turnout. Wallahi, um, I hope inshallah that you lot can benefit and inshallah I can take the reward because everything and just to finish off like brothers and sisters always whenever you do anything in life whenever you do any action in life make sure that there's an intention make sure there's always an intention behind it so inshallah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you're collecting that account you're, you're making your you're increasing your account in the akhirah not just in the dunya with your bitcoins and your cryptos and, and your money and your bank think also about okay yes you have your you have your account in the dunya but don't ignore your account when you die and you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Jazakumullah khairan. I appreciate it, brothers. Jazakumullah khairan. And uh, keep us in your du'as, inshaAllah. Jazakumullah khairan.